Dr. Dr. Baxter. Please come, please come inside and sit down. We want this to be a dignified occasion. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the, our first meeting of the, of the new academic year. Uh, today is an important, in fact it's the important uh, date in our, in our annual calendar. Uh, today we're going to be awarding the Arnold Pfeffer Prize. Um, and we're going to be awarding it to Dr. Stephen Swomey. So I'm going to just read you a, 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 a word or two. About five years ago I would have remembered all of this, but now I have to, I have to read it. Uh, uh, Stephen Swomey is Chief of the Laboratory of Comparative Ecology at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, NICHD, at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. He also holds appointments as Research Professor at the University of Virginia, the University of Maryland and the Johns Hopkins University and is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, the Pennsylvania State University and a different campus of the University of Maryland. Dr. Swermy studied psychology as an undergraduate at Stanford University, then continued his studies as a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, receiving his PhD in psychology in 1971. He then joined the psychology faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he rose to the rank of professor. In 1983, he left there to join the NICHD when he began his present position. Dr. Swerve has received international acclaim for his extensive research on biobehavioral development in rhesus monkeys and other primate species. His initial postdoctoral research successfully reversed the adverse effects of early social isolation previously thought to be permanent in recent months. His subsequent research at Wisconsin led to his election as fellow in the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Quote, for major contributions to the understanding of social factors that influence the psychological development of non-human primates, unquote. Since joining the NICHD, he's identified heritable and experiential factors that influence individual biobehavioral development characterized both behavioral and physiological features of distinctive rhesus monkey phenotypes and demonstrated the adaptive significance of these different phenotypes in naturalistic settings. His present research focuses on three general issues. First, the interaction between genetic and environmental factors in shaping individual developmental trajectories. Second, the issue of continuity versus change and the relative stability of individual differences through development. And third, the degree to which findings from monkeys studied in captivity generalize not only to monkeys living in the wild, but also to humans living in different cultures. Uh, throughout his professional career, Dr. Swermy has been the recipient of numerous awards and honors. To date, he has authored or co-authored over 400 articles published in scientific journals and chapters in edited volumes. He's also delivered over 400 invited colloquia, symposia, and workshop presentations, and convention papers in 44 states in the US and 20 foreign countries, including one of our international neuropsychoanalysis uh, congresses and various national psychoanalytic meetings. Following directly in the footsteps of such greats as Harlow and Bowlby, and therefore mining one of the richest seams of knowledge between psychoanalysis and biology. Few people indeed could have done more to advance the integration of psychoanalysis and neuroscience, although I must say in this case without evidently trying to do so. Um, and it's uh, for, uh, for this achievement that we award the Arnold Pfeffer Prize today to Dr. Swerman. This is a prestigious award uh, that was previously won by the likes of Antonio Damasio, Helen Mayberg, Yacht Panksepp, and Eric Kendall. And uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, to, to give the award to such an outstanding and, if I may say so, such a nice person. So please come up for your award. Uh, not 
now Dr. Sloan is going to present a, 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 an absolutely fascinating paper. Pay special attention at the end when he describes his most recent findings, which are phenomenally important. Dr. Sloan. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody how's that? First of all, uh, thank you, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. And I have to say it's a real pleasure and honor uh, to receive this award and to be in such a, in such an exceptional company, including uh, Professor Frank Depp, who's sitting a couple of rows back there. Glad you could make it, Doc. It's also nice to be back in this room. Uh, I've spoken here, I think, two times before. And the last time I was here, um, I seem to have forgotten my laser pointer, and anybody, as you'll see throughout this presentation, that was a real, proposing real problems. They had no pointer in the house, a quick survey of the audience yielded no pointer. So I started uh, clumsily moving along, and three minutes into the talk, somebody came running in from the outside who had run to the nearest CVS to purchase the pointer, and I still have it right here. So it's nice to be in familiar and friendly and supportive territory. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you about the research my colleagues and I have been doing over the last few years. Um, my laboratory from, from its inception at the Eunice Kennedy Schreiber National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, that's one of the things that's changed in the last five years. Uh, last year, my institute was renamed in honor of Eunice Kennedy Schreiber and the Kennedy family who were so instrumental in starting the NICHD 40 years ago. Uh, and my laboratory is, uh, in which we study rhesus monkeys is not on the main campus of the NICHD in Bethesda, but it's rather 30 miles outside of town, about 40 minutes from downtown D.C. up the Potomac, in the Maryland countryside near a little town called Poolsville, where we were able to have our monkeys uh, housed and living, many of them in largely naturalistic situations. So when I talk about Poolsville, that's the uh, facility to which I am referring to. Anyway, my lab out at Poolsville, since its inception, has been very interested in the study of individual differences in personality or temperament in the rhesus monkeys we watch grow up there, and how genetic and environmental factors act, and more importantly, actually interact to shape individual developmental trajectories. And over the years, we've been especially interested in two subgroups of monkeys. One, comprising about 20% of our population, as well as 20% of the rhesus monkeys at two field sites we've been fortunate enough to get access to, about 20% of our monkeys seem to be unusually fearful or anxious in the face of novel or mildly challenging circumstances. So situations or stimuli that most monkeys find really interesting and will readily explore, these monkeys avoid. And if they're forced to confront these situations or stimuli, they show profound arousal of a variety of biological systems, most notably the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that we see in terms of, of, of prolonged elevation of cortisol <coughs> and where we look at measure it, ACTH, uh, activation of the sympathetic nervous system that we see in terms of high and stable heart rate relative to other monkeys in similar situations, greater monoamine turnover, things like more epinephrine, and should the challenge be extended, um, some <coughs> compromising of the immune system. These monkeys look uh, very much like, uh, very much like um, a subgroup of children that people like Jerome Kagan have been studying and others have been studying for the last quarter century or so. Children who have been described as being behaviorally inhibited, who have the same behavioral and biological characteristics as these monkeys that we now know are at risk of developing childhood anxiety and depressive disorders, and some of whom, for whom that risk carries on into adolescence and into in the case of the adulthood. There's another subgroup of monkeys uh, in our colony, maybe 5 to 10 percent of the individuals in the colony, and again, 5 to 10 percent of the individuals that we study in the wild, who seem to be unusually impulsive, and their impulsivity gets them into trouble. They do stupid things that other monkeys should know better than to try, like get between a high-ranking adult female and her kids, or may, they may conf repeatedly confront a dominant adult male, and when that male beats them back, they're right back into that male's face. And when that adult male beats them back again, they're right back into that male's face. So not surprisingly, they tend to elicit a lot of aggression from other members of their troop. And they themselves tend to be excessively and often inappropriately aggressive. And 
more difficult, rather, uh, in contrast to most other monkeys who know when an aggressive bout starts getting uh, going up, they know how to back off and sort of lower the temperature of the interaction. When these guys get involved in an aggressive bout, often the intensity of the aggression escalates to the point where somebody can actually get hurt. And these monkeys also differ in certain biological features from others in their social group. And the difference we've been spending the most time studying over the last few years has been apparent deficits in serotonin metabolism that we see in terms of chronically low levels of the, of the central serot primary central serotonin metabolite 5 hydroxyhydroxyl acetic acid, or 5-HIAA. Um, so we've been interested, and these monkeys also look like a subgroup of children that people like Richard Tremblay in Montreal and others have been studying for many years. These are human children who by two years of age are already showing very high levels of aggression for whom, in contrast to most other two-year-olds for whom the aggression goes down over time, aggression stays at high levels in these kids. By the time they hit the school system, they usually are starting to cause problems within the classroom. They're often diagnosed as having, as, as, uh, having externalizing disorders. And unfortunately, some of them, by the time they're in their teens, you can find either in jail or in the morgue. And uh, these children also uh, seem to have share some of the same biological features as these monkeys. So we've been interested in these two subgroups of individuals for uh, a number of reasons. First, in both the cases of the fearful, uh, anxious like monkeys and the impulsive, aggressive monkeys, both the behavioral and biological characteristics show up very early in life usually within the first few weeks or months of life, and in the absence of major environmental change are remarkably stable from infancy to the childhood years, to adolescence, and even into adulthood. And we now have increasingly powerful evidence suggesting that at least some components of these features are highly heritable. That is, there is a strong genetic contribution to individual differences in, say, for example, HPA output for the fearful monkeys or, or um, serotonin metabolism for the impulsive and aggressive monkeys. But we also know, and I hope to convince you uh, without question today, that experiences can also affect these characteristics. And if even those heritable biological characteristics can be altered by experience, particularly early experience with social caregivers like mothers or substitute mothers. And we now know that these experiential effects show up not only at the level of behavioral output and emotional regulation, but also at the level of neurohormonal uh, uh, production at the level of monoamine metabol neuro neuro monoamine and neurochemical metabolism, the way the brain is functions and is structured, and even at the level of gene expression, and I hope to demonstrate that to you today. And finally, the, a third reason why we are interested in these individual differences I've already alluded to, given that my host institute is the National, as the Eunice Kennedy Shrive, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, we're quite interested in how these characteristics that we see in our monkeys might inform us uh, both as to the origins and the developmental trajectories of parallel patterns in human children and possibly suggest uh, strategies for intervention. So what I want to do this morning is begin by giving you a, a little bit of a background of the monkeys that I, my colleagues and I study because they really are a very unusual species. I'll then describe in greater detail these biobehavioral phenotypes the fearful monkeys and the impulsive aggressive monkeys. I'll give you some evidence regarding the heritability of some of these characteristics, but also hopefully some compelling evidence about what experience can do during development in these individuals. I will talk about gene by environment interactions, uh, how these genetic and environmental factors are not necessarily operating separately, but indeed are interacting with one another. And this, these studies have led us to a focus on very early interactions between mothers and infants. We will touch on a little bit on that and now finish by putting these findings in comparative perspective. So that's uh, what's on the agenda for the next hour and a half. Please bear with me. Okay, Rhesus monkeys. Rhesus monkeys are members of the macaque genus. There are 22 different species of macaques. Rhesus are only one of them. They are not our closest relatives. They only share about 95% of the same genes that we have. Uh, by contrast, the comparable figures for chimpanzees and bonobos, <coughs> our closest evolutionary relatives, are is somewhere between 98 and 99%. But rhesus monkeys are a lot more like us than our chimpanzees or bonobos or any of the great apes in one fundamental respect. They are a success story. 
They are the world's second most successful species of primates next to us. There are more rhesus monkeys living in the wild, encompassing a greater geographic range, experiencing a wider range of climates than any other species of non-human primates, um, with possibly one or two exceptions. And in the Indian subcontinent where they come from, they can be found in rainforests, hardwood forests, coniferous forests, in, in, uh, in um, desert areas, in savanna areas, and even in the foothills of the Himalayas, where the winters get a lot more cold than anything around here. So we have no problem maintaining our colony of rhesus monkeys in naturalistic setting outdoors year-round in rural Maryland with minimal shelter. Furthermore, rhesus monkeys are one of the few primate species, we're one of the other ones, that can be genuinely called or characterized as a weed species. That is, if you take them out of their natural habitat and put them someplace else, they thrive and actually expand their population. So whether every time somebody, some scientists or other people have taken monkeys out of the Indian subcontinent and put them someplace else, they've expanded their population, whether it's island off the coast of Puerto Rico, or the swampland outside of New Orleans, or the high desert, high arid plains in western Texas, or the Sacramento Valley, where it gets to over 100 degrees every day during the summer, or rural Maryland. In these and other places, these monkeys have thrived. And finally, they're unbelievably resilient and resistant. They can handle major changes and challenges in their physical and social environment that would cause real problems in most other species. And I could give you plenty of examples. I'll give you one anecdote. I'm sure all of you remember Hurricane Katrina, which four summers ago trashed, truly trashed New Orleans and the Mississippi Gulf Coast, causing enormous damage uh, and great human suffering and loss. Well, 30 miles north of New Orleans, on the northern shore of Lake Pon Pontchartrain, is the Tulane National Primate Research Center, where they have 3,000 rhesus monkeys living outdoors in pens and, and corrugated uh, in uh, the chain link uh, fencing. <coughs> Pens, um, living outside when Hurricane Katrina hit. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, it blew away all the fencing. But every single one of those 3,000 monkeys survived. They didn't lose a single one. And we now have an idea how it happened in each of those, those uh, outdoor pens. The caretakers had placed large concrete culverts for the sorts of things they used for drainage under expressways, so the monkeys had a place to get out of the hot Louisiana sun. And almost certainly what happened when the hurricane hit is the monkeys headed for the culture. Uh, culverts, rode out the storm, and then waited for the humans to show up with their breakfast. <laughs> so these monkeys are remarkably resilient, and they can handle things that humans have to deal with as well. This is my neuroscience uh, analytic uh, pointer works. Um, in the wild, and in those captive environments that so provide, such as what we have out in pools, well, these, these monkeys live in large social groups called troops. The troops can range in size from 30 or 40 individuals on the small end to over several hundred on the large end. But whether the troops are large or small, they all have the same basic social structure. Every troop is organized around several female-headed, multi-generational families or naturalized, plus males who have come in from the outside. And this arrangement derives, uh, this arrangement derives from the fact that rhesus monkey females stay in the troop in which they're born for their entire life, whereas rhesus monkey males stay only until puberty and then they leave. They either leave voluntarily or they're physically kicked out of their group. You, uh, then these males typically join all male gangs. They hang out in the gangs for anywhere from several months to over a year. And then they work their way to the two of the troop. So every troop has plenty of adult males and adult females in it. But the females have all been there since birth. And they're all related to one another, at least within their respective families. Whereas the males have been there only since puberty. And initially they're related to no one until they start having offspring of their own. And here's one typical rhesus monkey family. Here's a mother, newborn infant, grandmother's back there. This is an older sister of the infant. This is a younger sister of the mother. The other thing you should know about rhesus monkey social organization is within each troop, there are multiple dominance hierarchies. There is a hierarchy, for example, between families, such that every member of the highest ranking family, including infants, outranks everybody in the next house, highest ranking family, including adults, who outrank everybody in the third family, etc. So you see situations in the wild where infants from high-ranking families who are barely able to walk may be stumbling down a trail, and adults from lower-ranking families will be falling all over themselves to get out of the way of these little kids because they know if they cause those kids any problems, the rest of that high-ranking family will be on their back in no time at all. There's a separate hierarchy within each family that follows the general rule, younger daughters outrank older daughters. 
And it's easy to see how this starts because the mother will preferentially defend her newborn daughter from the harassment of a jealous older sister. So even though the older sister may be bigger and stronger than her younger sister, if the mother can back her up, that younger sister can get away with anything she wants in her interactions with her older sister. The interesting thing is that that relationship is maintained among those, between those sisters as long as they're both alive even after the mother is no longer around to differentially reinforce it, because where the mother leaves off, other members of the troop take over and continue to give deference to the younger sister in her actions, in her interactions with her older one. There's a separate hierarchy among the males that come into a troop that's roughly related to tenure. That is, the longer a male is in a troop, the more likely that male is to be high ranking. But of course, it's not tenure or length of time that's really important. What's really important is how good that male is at making friends and sustaining alliances not only with other males, but especially with high-ranking females who carry the real clout in the troop. The males that are good at that will stick around and move up the hierarchy, and males that are not so good at that will generally give up and leave and seek their fortune elsewhere. And then finally, there's a hierarchy among the infants that are born into a troop every year that roughly reflects the position in the troop of their mothers. So it's not that some infants are bigger or stronger or smarter or quicker than our others. Those, in those individual differences inevitably exist. It's that other monkeys associate a particular infant with a particular mother and afford an equivalent social status. So life in a recent monkey troop is a pretty complicated business. So for individuals to survive in such a group, not let alone thrive, they must not only acquire a complicated uh, social behavioral repertory, which I'll outline shortly, but they also have to acquire a great deal of information about other members of the troop. Who's related to whom? Where does everybody fit within these respective dominance hierarchies? as well as recent social history, who's been getting into fights recently? Who can you count on to back you up if you get into a fight yourself? The monkeys that learn this stuff and follow the rules inherent in complex social dominance hierarchies do very well in these complicated social groupings. And monkeys who are either unwilling or unable to learn and follow the rules don't last very long at all. So how, how do monkeys acquire them while they're growing up? Rhesus monkey infants, who by the way grow up about four times faster than we do, so, which is an enormous advantage for those of us who are interested in long-term effects, studying the long-term effects of early experience, or lifespan development, or the transmission of characteristics from one generation to the next. This four to one ratio is an advantage because we can see a generation transpire in four or five years instead of having to wait 15 or 20 for the, month, for the human equivalent. So when I give you an age in recent monthly months or years, multiply by four to get a rough human equivalent. At any rate, Rhesus monkey infants spend virtually all of their first month of life either in intimate social contact with or at arm's length, no more than arm's length away from their biological mother, usually in this ventral ventral posture as you see here. And during this time, a strong and enduring attachment bond is established between mother and infant. And it's of historical interest to me, maybe not to you, but certainly to me, that this uh, attachment bond is directly related to the attachment that was, has been described for human children by John Gibbons and children by John Bowlby. It's an interesting art fact in history that John Bowlby, um, at just about the time John Bowlby was developing his, his, his theory of attachment in the early and mid 1950s, his friend, uh, the Cambridge ethologist Robert Hind, uh, changed his primary area of study from song learning in birds to studies of mother infant interaction with rhesus monkeys. And Robert Hind introduced John Bowlby to my mentor, Harry Harlow, who just at that very same time was, this, was carrying out his pioneering research looking at uh, very early infant interactions with artificial cloth and wire mothers that still shows up in introductory psychology books a few years later. So between Harlow and Hind, Bowlby had all the, bio, all the evidence he needed to propose a biological basis for attachment and to argue that it was a product of evolution and something fundamental to our, to our species rather than some kind of uh, uh, feeling or, or more ephemeral sorts of things. So the biological basis for Bowlby's theory of attachment can be traced directly to studies of rhesus monkey mother and human interactions. At any rate, given this attachment of business, once infants become thoroughly attached and firmly attached to their mothers, they are able to use, uh, and during this time, by the way, Mothers are very protective of their infants. They're very picky about who they let interact with their infants. They usually don't let adult males close to them, which is one reason why in this particular species, not necessarily true in other primate species, but for rhesus monkeys anyway, adult males have very little to do with the early caregiving of the offspring. Females uh, 
with infants usually don't let unrelated uh, members of the group get too close to their infant. And this particular mother is now at the, about to let the photographer get a step closer. <laughs> These infants don't stay infants forever, however. Beginning in the second month of life, they start leaving their mothers for short periods of time to begin to explore their environment. And they do it in a very stereotyped fashion, again, straight out of Bowlby's theory of attachment. They use their mother as a secure base. So an infant will move away from the mother for a few feet and stay away for a few seconds, go running back to the mother for a period of time, and then go out a little bit more and explore some more, and then go running back to the infant mother for a period of contact. It's almost as if the infant were attached to his mother by a long rubber band. And as the weeks and months go by, these exploratory forays become more frequent, involve greater and greater distances and more and more time away from the mother, so that by six months of age, these monkeys are spending only about 20% of their waking hours in actual physical contact with their mother, as opposed to the 100% that they were spending during that first month. Yet the mother's presence in, that, in their immediate social environment and physical environment is exceedingly crucial to sustain this early exploration because, as Bowlby would tell us, um, if you lose your secure base or access to your secure base, any motivation to explore disappears and you become emotionally upset. So these mothers, even though their infants are not actually interacting with them all that much at this later, these later dates, are remain absolutely crucial components or parts of their, of their larger social world. What are these infants doing while they're away from their mother? Well, increasingly, they begin interacting with other members of their social group. And increasingly, these interactions come to center on other infants uh, like themselves. And in the wild, this is not by accident. In the wild, rhesus monkeys are seasonal breeders. They, they populate year-round, but the actual conceptions only occur within a two to three month period due to probably seasonal variation in male sperm count. And what this means is 80 or 90 percent of the troops' infants are born within a two to three month window. And what this guarantees is any youngster born during this time will have plenty of other youngsters with whom to interact. Youngsters who are about the same age, you know, about the same age, cognitive and physical and social capabilities as themselves. And that's what these monkeys do. Throughout the childhood years, the rest of the first year of life, the second year of life, and the third year of life, these monkeys spend several hours every day in active social play with one another. And it's in the context of this play that virtually every behavior pattern that's going to become important can be developed and practiced and perfected long before it actually has to become functional. So we view social play as an exceedingly important part of the socialization pro 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 uh, process and peer interactions to be as important as interactions between mother and offspring. And indeed, work by Harry Harlow and others way back in the 1960s, and others much more recently have convincingly and consistently demonstrated that rhesus monkey infants who are otherwise well socialized but deny the opportunity to play with peers as they are growing up, inevitably develop problems with reproductive behavior and real problems controlling aggression later in life. So, play support. When, as these monkeys approach puberty, which for females is the beginning of the third year of life and they're having their initial menses and thereafter have regular 26 to 28 day menstrual cycles, and males beginning of the fourth year when their testes descend and, and start producing viable sperm, and both genders show a pronounced growth spurt, it's at this point that they go their separate ways. As I mentioned, be as I mentioned before, females tend to stay in the, in the same not 10, they do stay in the same group in which they are born for the rest of their lives. They stay fairly close to their mother, not only socially, but physically. Here's a mother-daughter pair from one of our field troops. Daughter's on the right, and six months after this slide was taken, the daughter became a mother herself, and that's where you see the real strength of the natural life. Because the birth of a new infant, especially to a new mother, is a major social event for that family, and it has the effect of bringing the rest of the family around that new mother and infant, buffering them, from stresses and social pressures from the outside. Coincidentally, the birth of the new infant uh, has the effect of strengthening the ties that bind that family together so that interactions within, among family members go up, usually at the expense of intera interactions with non-family members. <coughs> so females will spend, continue to play an active role in social life, in family life, uh, for the rest of their lives, even after they have no longer having kids of their own. So grandmothers and great-grandmothers are just, are just as important of players in family life as our mothers and infants. And indeed, we see dramatic evidence of this. We just did in our own groups a couple of months ago. Oftentimes, when, uh, when the, high, the old matriarch in a high-ranking family either dies of old age or becomes physically debilitated, 
Uh, other members of the troop notice it right away, and within days, if not within hours, that high ranking troop may drop several notches in the dominance hierarchy uh, within the troop, no, lo no longer being as cohesive as it used to be when the old lady was around to keep things flowing. Oops. The story for males is completely different. Males don't stay in their native troops. They leave. They leave usually around puberty. They leave either voluntarily or they're physically kicked out of their social group, usually by unrelated females. And then these males go and join all male gangs. They hang out in the gangs for anywhere from several months to over a year, and then they try to work their way to another troop. And they now know two essential facts about this male integration. First, without a doubt, it's the most dangerous to the point, time, in the lifespan of these males. There's nothing like it prior to puberty, there's nothing like it after puberty, there's nothing comparable for females. It's been estimated from good field data that the mortality rate for these males from the time they leave home until the time they're successfully integrated into a new troop is somewhere between 40 and 50 percent. It is a very rough world out there for those young males, and almost half of them don't make. We also know that there are huge individual differences among these males in both the timing of emigration, that is how old they are when they leave, and then the strategies that they used to try to get to a new troop. And I won't go into the details of the timing or strategy at this point, only to, only to mention that we're getting pretty good at being able to predict on an individual basis which males are going to leave when and what, how they're going to try to get into a new troop based on the behavioral and biological profile that they show us while they're growing up. So this is the sequence that rhesus monkeys go from, go through from birth to maturity of nuts and essence. They've been doing it for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years and generations. And um, because uh, they're ex extraordinarily adapted, I have no reason to believe they will continue to do it for hundreds of thousands or millions of years and generations in the future. Because basically, they can live just about any place that we can, and some places that we can. So I think the rhesus monkeys are going to be around at least as long as we are as well. But that, of course, is my own particular bias. I really like the species. Okay. What about these subgroups? Um, let's start with the 20% of monkeys who seem to be unusually fearful or anxious in the face of novel or mildly challenging circumstances. We've used a lot of terms to describe these monkeys, fearful, anxious, uh, shy because of new social situations, they're re relatively reticent, uh, the term that, behaved, that uh, Jerome Kagan and others have coined, behaviorally inhibited. I think the term uptight covers it all. <laughs> this is an uptight monkey. This is, happens to be an adolescent male sitting on the periphery watching his, uh, his, uh, other, his age mates interact socially. And he's in marked contrast to most other monkeys in the group who, under the same circumstances, show trivial and same challenges and stresses, show trivial behavioral disruption and transient uh, physiological uh, response, and then go back to doing what they were doing before, in this case, getting moved by a friend. And in contrast to our uptight monkeys, these monkeys are more, to use another precise scientific term, laid back. Indeed, some of these people have argued that this monkey must have come from Southern California. But I, but I can guarantee you that he was born and bred and raised in Wisconsin, made the transition to the DC area, and he's still laid back. So anything's possible. These characteristics or uptight monkeys start uh, distinguishing themselves very early in life. At the age when most infants are off their mother and starting to explore, these monkeys are reluctant to leave their mother. They spend more time for longer periods of physical contact during those initial weeks and months than do their more laid-back counterparts. And when it gets time to go out and start exploring and interacting with peers, these monkeys literally have to be dragged into these early peer interactions. As I said, they tend to be very shy and reticent upon the initial social exposure. And we can demonstrate this, and we did many years ago, just in the laboratory, in the laboratory situation, all you have to do is bring young monkeys together in a playroom filled with toys and ladders and swings and rotating wheels that facilitate exploration, and bring them into the playroom for the first time and see what happens. And whereas more laid back monkeys who readily explore the environment and, and, and uh, try to initiate play bouts with others, the more uptight individuals will either stay in a corner or hang on to a friend, and as I said, literally have to be dragged into this situation. And we can see uh, not only behavioral differences, but biological differences as well. So, for example, one thing you can do, and we did many years ago, is hook up these monkeys, put, put heart rate electrodes on these monkeys, cover their chest with a little velcro lined vest, where the heart wires, uh, the heart rate, um, the things are hooked up to an FM transmitter that will we, we pick up the signal in the next room, we cover the, the uh, electrodes and the, and the uh, transmitter with a velcro lined vest so there's not monkeys wires hanging around so the monkeys can move over on 
freely, uh, parenthetically, the vest has a little NIH logo on it, so these monkeys know where, where things are coming from. And we put up heart rate from the data, they look something like this. Here are our heart rate patterns collected from four month old rhesus monkey youngsters going into a playroom for the first hour for, for the first time for one hour. And what you're seeing is heart rate over the first five minutes of that hour and the last five minutes of that hour. And the first thing you notice is heart rate, resting heart rate for a four month old rhesus monkey is about 240 beats per minute. They're pretty small, their hearts beat pretty quickly, but they beat even more rapidly when they go into the situation. Everybody's heart rate goes up. But even in this first five minutes, the reactive or uptight monkey's heart rates are higher significantly higher than those of their more laid-back counterparts. And by the end of the hour, where it's the laid-back, monkeys are back and heart rates are in the normal range. These individuals still have significantly elevated heart rates. Not only are their, their heart rates higher, they're more stable. There's less beat-to-beat -beat variability, lower levels of, of what my colleague Steve Portis has termed vagal tone. He's indicating that sympathetic nervous system is overriding parasympathetic input input to the vagus uh, controls heart rate variability. So these monkeys are sympathetically activated. If you were to take a blood sample or a saliva sample from these monkeys at the end of the hour, you would find that not only do these monkeys have higher and more stable heart rates, they have higher levels of cortisol, and we also found the ACTH. On the other hand, if you leave these monkeys in the same playroom for several hours, or bring them back Day after day, all of these differences disappear, both behavioral and biological. And under those circumstances, in familiar settings, you can't take tell uptight up or laid back monkeys apart. They look the same. And the same is largely true in the wild when these monkeys are in familiar situations with their mothers playing with familiar peers. They look perfectly normal. On the other hand, are, were these monkeys to experience a more uh, prolonged or pronounced stressor than going into a playroom for an hour? The differences between uptight and late that monkeys become more pronounced. And one such stressor that virtually every young monkey experiences when it's about seven months of age occurs when the mother gets used, gets interested in producing next year's infants. These monkeys are seasonal breeders, as I said, in the gestational age of 165 days. Last year's infant is about seven months old when next year's infant is getting conceived. And the way it works, reproduction works in reasons monkey troops is as follows. First of all, it's a female choice. Female will pick out a particular male in the troop, form with that male what's called a consort uh, pair, and then that pair will go off in the bushes for anywhere from several hours to several days uh, and do their thing. And then the female will dump that male, go back into the group, pick out a new male, they're not monogamous, go back into the bushes for another three or four days. And this may happen six or seven times during the course of a six to eight month, uh, six to eight, uh, two to three month breeding season. Well, of course, last year's infant is left largely in the cold during all of this. It can either stay back in its troop and, and wait for its mother to come back, or it can try to follow its mother while she's on, on her uh, comfort route. But of course, even if the monkey tries, the infant tries to follow the mother, it may be close physically, but it's pretty distant psychologically. The mother's not really too anxious to interact socially with her infant, and the social interactions that might uh, occur are, large, are unlikely to be positive in nature. So here's last year's infant watching this going on. Here's the consort pair of mothers being groomed by the male. And up in the crotch of the tree is last year's infant. If you look very carefully, you will see that last year's infant's mouth is wide open because it's screaming its head off. It's showing what will be called separation protest does. This is a very common feature in, in the non-human primates. Now most youngsters get over this, and by the time their mother is gone, and this has left the second or third time, they don't bother to follow her into the troop, they just set that <coughs> from the troop, they just wait for her to come back when she's done. And interestingly to us, uh, at this time, while mother is gone, male infants tend to increase their interactions as years, whereas female infants tend to increase their interactions. So already by seven months of age, you're seeing big differences in gender, in, as a function of gender in response to a challenge like this, differences that are predictive of the major life differences that will the major differences that will occur in life course later on. Now, fear these youngsters don't get over it. With each successive separation, they become, they become increasingly withdrawn and lethargic. They stop interacting socially. They stop exploring. They look like they're having sleeping problems. In many places, they, they stop eating. They, look, they really look depressed. And a few of them actually perish during this period, even though they're no longer nutritionally dependent on their mothers having been weaned several months before and even though their mothers are gone for three or four days at the most. And it's of great interest to us that these individuals who show this depressive-like reaction to response to separation, 
involuntary separation are the same individuals who in a playroom situation show this more anxious, uh, uptight pattern of response. So monkeys who seem to be, young monkeys who seem to be at risk for anxiety-like reactions to relatively minor challenges are also at risk for developing depressive-like responses when the challenges are more prolonged and extreme. They're the same individuals. We can see the same in the lab, where investigators have been studying under infant separation for all the way back behind the Carlo 40, 50 years ago. Um, and in uh, the lab, you see the same pattern of individual differences. The individuals who show uh, the response uh, of high and stable heart rates in the playroom tend to show this withdrawn depressive response, whereas uh, individuals who actively explore it in the playroom uh, at this age and under these circumstances, within hours, are starting to get up and move around and start looking for something else to do uh, than, than, uh, than uh, protest. And these monkeys will have higher cortisol levels, greater norepinephrine turnover, higher heart rate levels than in these individuals. Now, you can separate these monkeys from their social group and put them back in, and then a week, separate them again a week later, or a month later, or even a year later, which is exactly what happens in the wild, where at the same time every year, mother drops the kids and goes off into the bushes. And what we see is individuals who show this, these kind of responses to their initial separation continue to show those kind of separations to subsequent, so those kind of responses to the subsequent separation. Individuals who show more adaptive responses to initial separation continue to show these adaptive responses behaviorally and biologically to subsequent separation. So these individual differences in reaction to a stressor-like separation are exceedingly consistent throughout the whole uh, development. And we also know they're highly heritable. We you know it for a variety of reasons. Here's the first time we really figured, uh, got some indication of it. These are cortisol levels taken from offspring of three different males in our breeding colony. And the, uh, the males uh, never see their kids because the males stay in the breeding colony while the females produce offspring. Every male can produce can in, in impregnate more than one female every year, uh, but every female can only have one kid a year. So we have a lot of paternal half sibs same father, different mother, with no interaction between mother and father. And what we find is certain males tend to put out kids who have high cortisol levels. These are cortisol levels at six months of age, with six or seven offspring of male R6, six or seven offspring of male T78, six or seven offspring of male AA55, and what you see is male T78 consistently puts out high reactive kids. T78 himself turned out to be a relatively uh, high reactive kid. <coughs> there, uh, these and other data suggest that these particular differences are heritable. And they're also predictive of things that, have, that can happen later on. So, for example, one thing that our colleagues do with some of our monkeys when they reach uh, adolescence and young adulthood is they run them through the monkey version of a happy hour, where every, hour, every day for a period of several weeks and months, these monkeys are given for one hour a day, unlimited exposure to 9% nutrient-sweet flavored alcohol solution, <laughs> non-alcoholic nutrient-sweet flavored solution, or plain tap water. So they are not fluid deprived, and they have this stuff in familiar situations. And in these circumstances, some monkeys drink, consume a lot more alcohol than do others. And it turns out that the alcohol consumption can be predicted reasonably well by how these monkeys react by their cortisol levels um, when they were six months old, subject to the separation. So what you see on Ordinate is cortisol levels at four months of age, what you see at the abscissa, uh, sorry, wrong way around. Here's cortisol at, at levels at six months, here's alcohol consumption at four years, and what you see is monkeys who had high levels of cortisol when they were six months of age, consume a lot of alcohol four years later, <coughs> low levels at six months, consume relatively low levels later on. So these uptight monkeys in this situation appear to be consuming more alcohol. Interestingly enough, the six-month cortisol levels are better predictor of four-year alcohol consumption than our four-year cortisol levels. So something early on is setting these monkeys up for some big, certain developmental trajectories. And what happens to these monkeys in the wild? Not too much uh, during their juvenile years, uh, because they're, after all, with familiar individuals interacting in, the, in familiar situations. The interesting thing for us occurs when it's time for the males to leave in the wild, because what we find is uptight individuals tend to postpone the emigration as long as they possibly can. So if you look at, uh, if you look at who is leaving when, uh, early emigrators as opposed to later emigrators, the ones who are leaving early are the ones with high and stable heart rates, high cortisol levels, except, excuse me, the ones who are leaving late are the ones with 
high stable hydrates and high cortisol levels, they don't leave until seven or eight years of age, whereas most of the others in their cohort are leaving at four or five years. And it turns out that this may actually be adaptive because the best predictor of survival for males during this very difficult time is how physically large and heavy they are at the time they leave home. So males that are able to postpone immigration until their growth, adolescent growth period is completely finished are much more likely to survive than those who leave either in the middle of that growth period or before it occurs. And these males are able to do this by not causing problems. They're tolerated by other females, and they're allowed to stay around until essentially their growth spurt is finished. And then when they do finally leave, they take a very conservative way of getting into new troops. They essentially bypass the all-male troops. And so, despite the fact that they're at risk of developing anxious and depressive-like patterns earlier in life, and get, when given the chance to consume excessive amounts of alcohol, under these circumstances, being uptight is actually adaptive. It's not always a bad thing to be uptight. In some cases, it could improve your survival. And this is something point I want to come back to. There's a comparable story for females, by the way. Uptight females, when they are in having their first kids and their social situation is very unstable, they're at high risk of neglect and abuse or offspring. But those same females in very social, the very stable social situations actually turn out to be exceptionally good mothers. They're very supportive of their kids. They look out. Uh, they're much more vigilant in monitoring their kids, and they're also going to turn out with better outcomes in the long run than do than would normally be the case. So the same, same females whose uptight status puts them at risk in unstable situations to be relatively uh, inadequate mothers. When they get a lot of social support, support, they're really good mothers. So once again, it depends on the circumstances in which these characteristics emerge. And what about this subgroup of impulsive aggressive monkeys, the five to ten percent of the population? Um, that we see in, at pools and in, in, in natural troops. As I mentioned, they tend to show a chronic deficit in such a serotonin metabolism that we monitor in terms of their chronically low level, the primary central serotonin metabolite, 5 hydroxy acetic acid, or 5-HIAA, and a very consistent finding in our laboratory, other primate laboratories working with, with uh, different species of non-human primates, as well as the substantial clinical literature largely uh, developed during the 1990s has consistently reported an inverse relationship between FIAA levels and aggression, such that for both humans and monkeys, the most aggressive individuals also tend to have the lowest chronic levels of, chronically low levels of CSF FIAA. And as was the case for the uptight individual, we can see these patterns showing up early in life. For the aggressive individuals, we see it most often in the context of play. So, as I mentioned, play is a very important part of the socialization process, especially among males. And for males, just like for human males, a very common form of play in early childhood is what's called rough and tumble play. It's like play fighting, or play on a little job. Yacht would tell us it's not actually fighting. It looks like a wrestling match, where these, there's a lot of physical contact. These monkeys are grabbing each other, sham fighting, pulling, in, uh, pulling hair, and stuff like that. But usually nobody gets hurt, except when these particular males are involved. When these impulsive males are involved, what start, may start off as a benign play bout and a rough rap and tumble play bout may actually quickly escalate into a bout of real aggression for somebody to get hurt. And not surprisingly, other members of the troop soon recognize and learn who these individuals are, and they start avoiding them like the plague. So these aggressive young monkeys, while they are growing up, even though they're surrounded by some potential playmates, actually are play deprived because nobody wants to play with them. And at this early age, we can see this negative relationship between escalation, uh, escalated aggression, and 5 hiaa levels, so that the monkeys with the highest levels of aggression are showing the lowest levels of CSF, 5 hiaa And we see this same, this was uh, uh, from monkeys who are six months old in a field setting. We see this same, same negative relationship between 5 hiaa and other measures of impulsive activity. So for example, one thing monkeys can do especially at this age, like to do is climb up the trees and jump from treetop to treetop, often in absolutely spectacular fashion, and leaping bounds that would make most human gymnasts relatively jealous. But these leaps, while impressive, can also be dangerous, because if you're a long way off the ground and your target's a long way away, and you don't miss, make your target, you're going to be in big trouble. So here's one monkey making one of these impressive, uh, the impulsive leaps. Here's his buddy that got to the end and stopped. He's looking down. I don't know if he's looking at the ground or at his partner that didn't quite make, make the target. 
you look at the relationship between dangerous leapings and 5-HIAA, and you find the same negative relationship. So monkeys who have the greatest proportion of, of engaging in leaps greater than 5 meters in length, 16 feet, and more than 4 meters above the ground, 13 feet, are the ones with the lowest CSF 5 hiaa concentration. Now we studied the ontogeny of this pattern in the lab pretty carefully, and we now know that there are some very really interesting predictors of it. So one of the things we do with all of our instruments going in the lab is throughout the first month of flight, run them through the monkey version of the Brazelton Neonatal Assessment Scale. So those of you who know anything about human nutrition, this is a, a scale, set of scales developed by Barry Brazelton, and Barry Brazelton and his students in the late 1970s and 80s. Um, it's a comprehensive you know, test of, that measures neonatal reflexes and makes judgments about infant temperament, how, how irritable an infant is, how easy it is to solve, etc. And it turns out that the monkey Brazelton can be translated to the human Brazelton virtually item by item and cluster by cluster because after all, both monkey and human infants are born with the same neonatal reflexes, they're born with the same basic emotional capabilities, or expressions, and it's, relative, it's just as easy to tell how tough it is to soothe a, a crying infant, a um, human infant, as a crying human, uh, monkey human, or how irritable they may be as well. And when we do the Brasilton for these monkeys, we find that on two major clusters of the monkey Brasilton, there are monkeys who are going to grow up later in life to be, uh, to be impulsive and aggressive, show real deficiencies in their, in their behavior. One of them is state control. These monkeys, um, these monkeys have very poor state control. They tend to fluctuate wildly from being hyperactive to hypoactive during that first month of life. This particular infant has very good state control. The other thing they're not very good at is measures of visual and auditory orienting. So in this task, for example, a toy is moved across the infant's visual field and see how well that infant can follow that toy. The monkeys who are going to grow up to be impulsive and aggressive usually don't do very well on this particular item on the test battery either. And these monkeys at this very early age already have very low levels of CSF5HIAA, and those levels stay low throughout development. So here, for example, is a scatter plot of 5 hiaa concentrations taken sample from the same monkeys at 14 days of age when they're infants, and again at four years of life when they're into early adulthood. And what you can see is enormous stability of individual differences. Monkeys who had very low levels when they were two weeks of age still have low levels four years later. Monkeys who had high levels at two weeks of age still have very high levels four years later. So these individual differences in 5 hiaa concentrations that are extraordinarily stable throughout the whole of development and are also highly heritable. That is, there is a significant um, genetic component to these individual differences. Now we've watched these monkeys um, tested these monkeys on, when they're juveniles on a delay of gratification test. They do very poorly. We give them chances to be impulsive. For example, presenting them with a black box that's got a hole in it uh, where there might be something nice inside that box, but it also might be something really nasty. Most monkeys are being phobic. Don't go anywhere near that black box. These guys, the latency to get their, to get their hands inside is with, you can measure in milliseconds. And when these monkeys get to be adolescents and young adults and go through the happy hour, they too drink aggression, ex uh, alcohol excessively. So if you look at 5-HIAA concentrations and, and the alcohol consumption, here's 5-HIAA, here. Here is alcohol consumption. And what you can see is the monkeys with the lowest levels of 5-HIAA are the ones that are consuming, in this case, it's the most alcohol. So like uptight monkeys, these monkeys drink to excess when they get a chance. But unlike uptight monkeys who tend to drink as if they're self-medicating, that is, they sip, uptight monkeys sip little bits of alcohol throughout the hour, these guys are binge drinkers. The hour stop, starts and they drink until they drop. Literally achieving blood alcohol levels that God forbid they should get behind the wheel of a car. <laughs> They'd be at risk of being picked up for a while while intoxicated. What happens to these monkeys in the wild? Well, if they're males, the prognosis is terrible. Because if you think penis don't like these young males, adult females who carry a real plot of the can't stand them, consider them threats to their own offspring, so they start harassing these males mercilessly from very early on in life with the intent of driving them out of the troop. So here's one aggressive two-year-old male, except right now he's not being very aggressive because he's being modeled by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine adult females who want him gone, and they usually succeed. 
That is, they usually succeed in kicking these young males, these aggressive young males, out of the troop before they're three years of age, well before puberty. And what happens to these males? Well, they lack the social skills to get into another troop. They even lack the social skills to get into an all male gang. So these males go solitary, and most of them perish within a year. That is, most of them don't make it to reproductive age. So here we have a little paradox. If you have males that are not making it a, a, a characteristic that's highly heritable, and most of the males who have this characteristic aren't making it to puberty, how in the world can this stay in the gene pool? And there are these three possibilities. One of the possibilities is what, what you might call the silver bullet idea. Maybe a few of these males are bottom of their group, bottom of their group, and the group less by other females, and the group other females less. But they do stay in the group, and they do have kids. So maybe what we're seeing is being passed on to the female genome. But there's another possibility as well, and that is if you look at the maternal behavior of these females, it leaves a lot to be desired. There's a high incidence of neglect and abuse early in life among these females, and if their offspring are able to survive, then they're, they're, these females tend to be overly restrictive and prevent, uh, restrict their interest from going out, exploring, and interacting uh, with other peers. So maybe what we're seeing in their offspring is not so much a function of the mother's genes, but the mother's of, of a function of their mother's less than adequate maternal behavior. And of course, in the wild, you can't tell these apart. But you can in the lab, where it's possible through cross-fostering procedures and others, to separate out these genetic and environmental effects. And that's what we've been able to do uh, with a variety of other varying procedures. The one I want to talk about the most is something that we call peer or together, together peer only or together, together, rearing. Here, monkeys are separated from the biological mothers at birth. Hands are in the neonatal nursery, and then within the first week of life, on the first month of life, put in with other peers, like other youngsters, like themselves, where they live with one another 24 hours a day until they're about six or seven months of age. And then we move them into larger social groups that contain their mother reared counterparts. So the differential social experience I'm going to talk about is only for the first six months of life. Thereafter, mother reared and pure reared monkeys are growing up in the same physical and social environment. And during the six months, these pure reared monkeys develop hyper-attachments to one another, attachments that are probably stronger than between mother and infant. Yet these attachments, while very powerful, are actually non-functional or even dysfunctional because these monkeys spend too much time clinging to one another instead of going out to explore their base. And not surprisingly, because a pure is not nearly as good as a mother, you know, less than an optimal mother at providing a secure base for being able to soothe and console um, its partner when it gets upset. And when these monkeys get to the age where they should be starting to play with one another, they do develop patterns of play, but the play never reaches the level of complexity or sophistication that you see in your mother or counterparts. Um, it's usually short-circuited, it never really starts to expand like you see during the months four, five, and six of life for these uh, mother reared monkeys. So these peer reared monkeys, even though they're living with potential playmates 24 hours a day, are actually playing the pride of it as they are growing up. And this has its consequences. For one thing, peer reared monkeys, as they get older, seem to be more fearful than seems that would seem obvious. They look very much behaviorally like a 20% subgroup I was talking to you about before, of naturally monkeys and naturally occurring groups that I was talking about before. Not only are they more fearful, they show higher levels of HPA activity, at least throughout the first year of life, whether you're measuring it in plastic, in blood, or in saliva, or more recently, as we've been able to do, measuring it in hair, there's been much more short-term and long-term HPA activity under comparable circumstances in pure monkeys. Not only are pure monkeys more fearful than mother reared ones, they're also more aggressive. And as they get into the second and third year of life, they start showing these explosive patterns of aggression that's again characteristic of this 5 to 10 percent of the population in naturalistic troops. And not only do they have higher rates of aggression, they also have lower levels of CSF 5 HIAA. Whether you're looking during the first year when these levels are relatively high, or later in life, this is actually year five, um, when the levels have dropped for everybody, but if anything, the really condition differences have gotten bigger as the monkeys have gotten older. This is not the product of genetic differences. This is the product of individual of, of differences in early rearing. We, when we run monkeys through, the period monkeys through the, uh, my colleagues at the alcohol institute run them through the happy hour, we find that as a group, period monkeys consume significantly less alcohol as a group than their mother reared counterparts. And very recently, we've been able to do some neuroimaging studies of these monkeys. 